last and least? Psychedelic assisted therapy in the bluegrass state? Who's excited for that, anyone? Yeah, okay. So I'm Ben Askins, but all my favorite people call me Doc, which is confusing, because I'm a physician assistant, not a doctor, but I was a combat medic for a decade when I earned the nickname the hard way. So you guys can call me whatever you want, uh, but that's what I prefer to be called Doc. Uh, so a little bit about me. I was a combat medic for a decade and then I was okay enough at it that the military sent me to the inter-service physician assistant program to be a PA. Along the way there I had some deployments and I picked up a Master of Divinity degree at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary as well. And after I got done with IPAP, the PA program, I graduated and came to Louisville to practice in psychiatry with Dr. Robert Stewart in Louisville. Um, that was February of 2020. I don't know if you remember what happened in March of 2020, but it was a really weird time to start uh, a medical career, a mental health practice. I did the body mullet thing where you wear like the suit up top and the Hawaiian shorts down below doing telehealth care a whole bunch, but we also provided ketamine assisted therapy in the office there. So there were a whole bunch of people who Normally, we might have wanted to put on an inpatient psychiatry uh, hold of some kind or another, but because of COVID, that was a high risk thing to do. So I wound up managing a lot of acutely suicidal people with Dr. Stewart's supervision there in Louisville. Uh, about a year later, I got called up with a notification of sourcing to deploy to Kosovo last year. So I spent most of last year as the battalion surgeon for the first of the 149th Infantry, headquartered out of Barville, Kentucky. They spell it Barberville, but everybody says it Barville down there, right? Uh, about three months after I came back from that deployment, I went and got a certificate in MDMA-assisted therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder from the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS. It's a mouthful to say out loud to someone else, but... Uh, Earlier, and then earlier this year, I got involved in some things around what's called the Ibogaine Initiative. Have any of you heard of this particular, uh, it's grabbing some headlines currently anyway, but I'll talk about that near the end. I'll plug it up front and then I'll get you to pay attention until the end there, right? Uh, what I wanna talk to you all about today is just medicine. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about ketamine for suicidality. I'm gonna talk about MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder and talk about psilocybin for depression, and then a little bit about ibogaine. That's a whole bunch to cover, so I'm gonna talk for maybe 10-ish minutes about each one, and then leave a little time for question and answer at the end, okay? Ketamine is an interesting medicine. It is legal. Its FDA indication is as an anesthetic. At high doses, it's the most commonly used anesthetic in the world. It's on the World Health Organization's essential medicines list because it's such a safe anesthetic. If a little kid breaks their arm and goes to the emergency room and needs the bones relocated, they're probably gonna get a dose of ketamine. If grandma's gonna go get her colonoscopy in the colonoscopy suite, they're probably gonna give her ketamine because of the low risk of any effects on cardiorespiratory function from ketamine. Ketamine was first synthesized in 1962 in what was called the Ideal Anesthetic Research Trials. It was the uh, second step after they created fencyclidine or PCP or angel dust, if you've heard of that one, which also had low impact on the way that the heart and the lungs functioned, but induced this sort of uh, awakening phenomenon is what they called it. It was about an eight hour psychotic episode in the post anesthesia care unit that someone would undergo. And they said, maybe we should go back to the drawing board. This is a less ideal anesthetic than what we were shooting for and they came up with ketamine to use instead. At very low doses, ketamine is an analgesic medicine. In the military, that was where we got introduced to it a lot as a combat medic, was in point of wounding care. You could use ketamine at a low dose to take away someone's pain that you still wanted to be able to converse with. Or at a very high dose, you could say night-night and send them off to someplace else to higher echelons of care. Now in psychiatry, we wind up using this middle range of doses. Uh, we call them sub-anesthetic doses, somewhere in the half to one milligram per kilogram range. 
and people will have what's called a dissociative experience there. Ketamine's considered a dissociative anesthetic, which is a confusing word. First of all, it's dissociative in the sense that the experience someone has while they're taking ketamine involves kind of dissociating in the way that's similar to what's described by people who are severely traumatized and dissociate from their own identity or their own personality. Um, it also disconnects some things in thalamocortical relays in the brain that dissociate some of the connections in the midbrain. So that's also why it gets called a dissociative anesthetic. What we do in psychiatry is somewhere in that, that middle range of where we're playing around with getting close to dissociation, um, but also allowing somebody to have a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And that's the thing that kind of ties together all the different psychedelics that I'm gonna talk about, they all induce what's called a non-ordinary state of consciousness one way or another. And that's the thing, so long as you have a state of consciousness, there are ways to make it not ordinary anymore, right? This is Kentucky, this is bourbon country. A whole bunch of you tonight are going to induce a non-ordinary state of consciousness, I'd wager, right? Uh, alcohol is one way of acquiring a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Exposures to extreme environments, extended fasting, birth, death, like you were talking about in one of the talks earlier. We call those sorts of things condensed experiences in psychedelic assisted therapy circles where a whole lot of things are going on inside of somebody's head and inside of somebody's life that condenses down in a very meaningful sort of way. And that's what we're trying to induce with some of these psychedelic medicines. Ketamine being the only legal example currently. Ketamine has a unique mechanism of action in psychiatry as well. Like we're all familiar with SSRIs and atypical antidepressants that are DRIs or SNRIs and atypical antipsychotics that work on a whole host of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin uh, neurons, correct? So ketamine's mechanism of action is exerted on the N-methyl-D aspartate, or NMDA receptor, which works on glutamatergic neurotransmission. Glutamate being the primary gas pedal in your brain, and then GABA being the primary brake pedal that balances things out in terms of neurotransmission and a whole bunch of other serotonergic, dopaminergic, and norepinephrine-based uh, neurons further down in the dorsal raphe nucleus and the ventral tegmental area and the locus ceruleus, right? So what ketamine does at the glutamate receptor is it has a dose-dependent binding affinity. And you've got NMDA receptors presynaptically and postsynaptically, and then it exerts some effects on what's called the GABAergic interneuron. All this sciencey sort of Stephen Stahl Neuroscience Education Institute stuff is what you get asked in like psychiatry, CAQ, sorts of questions if that's of interest to anybody. What matters downstream of a whole bunch of that is that you can turn everything off in a GABA to glutamate ratio with an anesthetic dose or you can dial things down significantly with an analgesic dose and in psychiatry and mental health in that middle sub-anesthetic dosing range, we're creating a, a new balance in the ratio of GABA to glutamate. Why does that matter? It matters because there's a little part of the brain called the lateral habenula that's involved in, it's sort of like uh, the movie 300 where like they decided to have the battle at the uh, Thermopylae that the hot gates because that was a narrow place that mattered in terms of the overall battlefield. The lateral habenula is this narrow place that matters between the cerebral cortex and the motor cortex and the brainstem down below where a whole lot of things get funneled through there. And if we can correct the GABA to glutamate ratio in the lateral habenula, that's gonna have a major impact on all of the ratios of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine downstream from that. Is that making sense so far? Okay. Ketamine's also considered a dirty drug in terms of its mechanism of action. Dirty, not like it's been stepped on in the street or something along those lines, right? It just has a bunch of mechanisms of action. So we can't exactly pinpoint which one is the prime mover here, although the NMDA receptor has been uh, 
the focus of much research. Interestingly enough, we didn't discover the existence of the NMDA receptor in preclinical models until the 1980s, and we were using it as an anesthetic for over two decades before we figured out that much about how it works. So do we really understand how it works yet? A lot of research ongoing in that respect. It also is intensely anti-inflammatory. There were COVID trials where the rescue medicine for the respiratory problems that someone had was ketamine because it is systemically anti-inflammatory. So there are phenotypes of depression that are neuroinflammatory. I have a patient that has ulcerative colitis and always has a depressive episode alongside of an ulcerative colitis flare. So he knows that he's gonna have to call up his GI doc and his psychiatrist at the same time. And he comes in and gets a ketamine infusion whenever he has an ulcerative colitis flare to prevent having a depressive episode. And that's worked for him for years. He's off of all of his oral antidepressants and he just predictively, based on having a neuroinflammatory phenotype of depression, he stayed undepressed for a very long time on two ketamine infusions a year, okay? Um, ketamine also, it, ha it works on the NMDA receptor and then a metabolite of ketamine, hydroxynorketamine, is also uh, being looked at as a potential candidate for an oral antidepressant to be developed later. So some of the metabolites of ketamine are antidepressant in and of themselves. So a whole bunch of different things going on in that regard. What's most interesting and we understand the least is that ketamine is not just a rapidly acting antidepressant, it's also got a rapidly anti-suicidal property that deserves to be looked at more closely in research but hasn't quite gotten there yet. But uh, some of the clinical trials that have looked at hospitalized patients to compare, you know, the old B52, or you f do you remember the B52 with like Haldol and Benadryl and Valium in a mix to try to knock somebody out who's psychotic? They're still using that in a whole bunch of, you know, psychiatric emergency rooms out there, but uh, there's some trials looking at comparing that head-to-head -head with ketamine that maybe we can look at whether or not there'd be a better way of taking care of acutely suicidal people with psychotic features that involves ketamine. I could talk about ketamine for a really long time, but that's about 10 minutes. Now I gotta roll on to MDMA, okay? So MDMA is uh, significantly different from ketamine. Ketamine's a very unique medicine, both in its mechanism of action and its history, and it's <laughs> the fact that it remains legal despite the war on drugs making everything else illegal in the 70s and 80s. MDMA was first synthesized in 1912 by Merck in what were, uh, research trials looking at trying to figure out some new blood thinners, and MDMA wasn't a very good blood thinner, but several decades later in the 70s, it was resynthesized by a famous chemist, Alexander Sasha Shulgin, and started to be used in group psychotherapy contexts in the 70s. Um, MDMA, 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine, is a serotonergic amphetamine, so it has this unique mechanism of action, again, among all of the psycho uh, psychedelics that are out there, where it's a triple, a mild triple reuptake inhibitor, right? So it has, exerts influence on DAT, NET, and CERT, the dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin reuptake pumps. Now, uh, there's a famous medicine drug that uh, exerts influence at a much higher level at all three of those called cocaine that we won't be talking about today at all because nobody's looking currently at any therapeutic uses beyond like uh, dental <laughs> anesthesia or, uh, <laughs> is the only indication I remember there being for cocaine, right? At a much lower affinity, MDMA blocks all three of the major neurotransmitters so that you have more of that available in the synapse to be used. And then it also exerts some influence on the vesicular monoamine uh, monoamine oxidase uh, transporter 2, the VMAT2 inside of the presynaptic neuron so that you're actually able to flush out a whole lot more serotonin into the synapse to be used. So you've got all of the, all of the good things that we're trying to target with traditional antidepressants being upregulated in the synapse whenever someone takes a dose of MDMA. The uh, impact there, the balance of activity between serotonin and the other dopamine and norepinephrine neurotransmitters there, creates very positive feelings in and of themselves, but MDMA also exerts an influence on 
a neurohormone called oxytocin. In the brain, we call it oxytocin. Out in the body, we'll call it vasopressin, and it has a whole lot of downstream effects. Uh, it's the neurohormone that's considered to be responsible for pair bonding between parents and newborn children or with in-groups of close-knit people. Uh, you know, if, if you have any friends in the room, it might be partially mediated by oxytocin. Uh, in a you know, professional way or, or whatever, as all members of Kappa here, maybe we'll all be friends someday. And some of that's an oxytocin dependent interaction among all of us, right? Whether, to what degree oxytocin plays a role in the positive effects in PTSD treatment with MDMA, that's still being debated, but that's primarily what's going on at uh, a neurotransmitter level. What takes place whenever someone ingests MDMA in terms of the emotional experience that they're having, the non-ordinary state of consciousness induced by MDMA, is that the amygdala is essentially turned down, the amygdala being the relay center for a whole lot of fear and anxiety. So fear gets turned down in the central nervous system and then with oxytocin and serotonin, as well as dopamine and norepinephrine being turned way up, love and connection and the opposite of fear winds up being turned up so that a person in a therapy session while they're taking MDMA is able to revisit traumatic memories from a place of strength and compassion and courage rather than a place of fear and overwhelm. The standard of care in PTSD therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive processing therapy or exposure therapies of one kind or another. Exposure therapies being just revisiting those memories raw often enough that maybe they're not as traumatic as they used to be. What we can do with MDMA now is make it possible for people to approach those memories from a place of strength rather than a place of weakness uh, and to in incorporate those memories into their narrative life story in a way that essentially takes that memory and puts it on the shelf in the memory library so that it stays there instead of constantly jumping off the shelf and hitting you in the back of the head the way that PTSD kind of shows up in somebody's life. You're just looking for a cookbook or a f an old family photo album and you get hit in the head with a different memory is a bit what it's like to have some of those uh, you know, re-experiencing flashback sort of symptoms of PTSD. Now in the clinical trials that are run, MDMA is an interesting med because it is first uh, a schedule one medicine currently, but early next year, it's slated to be considered for rescheduling to be a schedule two medication. That was the certificate that I went to get from MAPS was so that I and my collaborating physician, Dr. Kristen Dawson, uh, will be the two first prescribers in the state of Kentucky that would be able to write for uh, MDMA if slash when all of the process gets rolled out for how that takes place. We got the training on how to perform the therapy, but all of the rules will kind of depend on how things get changed with uh, the FDA. With uh, it being next in line in terms of being rescheduled, there have been several clinical trials published around MDMA for PTSD that are, are very specific around the dosing protocols, and the clinical indications and the way that the therapy gets conducted. The basic idea though in the clinical trials is that someone's only taking this medicine three times over a period of around two to four months and there's around 42 hours of therapy being done around those three medicine sessions that are very in-depth and very involved. So it's a co-therapy dyad that's performing the therapy with the person there's uh, three preparatory sessions, a medicine session, three integration sessions, and then a medicine session with this amount of 60 to 90 minute therapy sessions with two therapists around it. Very time intensive, very uh, resource intensive uh, way of doing this compared with treatment as usual, which is some combination of SSRI, right? Like paroxetine or sertraline or the two that have indications for PTSD, and then talk therapy of whatever evidence-based way, but you know, looking at perpetually doing that. At the end of the clinical trial periods, people who were included in these trials were some of the most severe cases of PTSD that you could imagine that still met the inclusion criteria. What's been called complex PTSD, but which isn't 
a category in the DSM-5 that we use professionally, people with extensive childhood trauma, developmental trauma, extensive combat trauma, and who have tried several other things and failed, you know, the, the treatment resistant class or whatever uh, in that regard. People who's, you know, they use the CAPS-5 scale, which is one of the most in-depth scales for measuring the outcomes. It's, it's an exhausting process to do the CAPS-5 with somebody. It takes like an hour to do that interview. They had one person drop out of one of the trials as a patient because they just didn't want to do the CAPS-5 interview ever again. It was that triggering for them, but that's the level of detail they were looking at for trying to do these analyses, right? And people who are coming in maxing out the CAPS-5, 67% of them no longer met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD after three sessions and 42 hours of therapy. That's somebody who, you know, if they walked in the door and didn't tell you their history, you wouldn't diagnose with PTSD in the first place. That's interesting in and of itself, but with ongoing monitoring, the durability of that efficacy has lasted upwards of 12 months afterward, where people whose essentially PTSD is put into remission and then stays in remission for a year afterwards, compared with SSRI for the foreseeable future, this seems to many people to be a much preferable al alternative. It was 87% of people in that trial who had treatment response defined as taking that CAPS five scale score and cutting it in half. So it was helping a whole bunch of the other people, that other third there. I got to talk to some of the researchers when I was in the training and I said, so like, what's the deal with the other third? Are they just that treatment resistant? Does it, the medicine not work for them? And they said, look, it's a clinical trial. We had to run everybody through the same process. That other third, if we could have done six sessions with them, I think we could have gotten them to the same place as these other two thirds of people who only needed three of them, right? How that'll get rolled out in the community and in the clinic, all of that's to be decided, to be declared later on. Um, but the potential there seems to be paradigm shifting in terms of treating PTSD. There are also ongoing clinical trials looking at uh, couples therapy and group therapy and the potential to use it in personality disorders and there's a whole lot of psychedelic science to be done down the line by some pretty big name you know schools out there like Johns Hopkins and uh, Stanford and uh, all over the world they're doing these um, so MDMA for PTSD very promising hopefully available next year here in Kentucky we'll see knock on wood wherever there's wood around here okay um, that's enough about MDMA. Let's talk just a little bit about psilocybin. Psilocybin being a medicine derived from magic mushrooms, right? And everybody's heard of magic mushrooms. And this is where we get to talk about classical psychedelics. The classical psychedelics being 5-HT2A agonists. That's a particular serotonin receptor. MDMA has some mild binding affinity at 5-HT2A, but it's very unique compared with LSD or peyote or mescaline or some of those classical fear and loathing in Las Vegas type psychedelic that, uh, that you're talking about. <coughs> with psilocybin in the clinical trials, we're looking at an extract. You know, it's being made, synthesized in a laboratory. It's not generally just a mushroom pulled out of the dirt that they're giving somebody, but um, the classical psychedelics fall into this, this interesting category, right? I told you about how MDMA was first synthesized in 1912 and ketamine was first synthesized in 1962. 2019, they published a study where they found a mushroom that makes ketamine. Mushrooms are really interesting, you know, genus of living thing on planet Earth. If you trust DNA analyses, it was about six million years ago that humans separated out from fungus. We have more in common at the DNA level with mushrooms than we do with spinach for what that's worth. Uh, and some mushrooms make serotonin and serotonin is real heavily involved in you looking at me right now and hearing the sounds of my voice. So who knows what mushrooms hear and see and, uh, and what's going on in that regard, right? <coughs> so psilocybin, the original trials were looking at treatment of end of life anxiety in a palliative care context for people with terminal oncology diagnosis, people dying of cancer. Can we give them less anxiety about their deaths? And the results there were pretty uh, shocking. Here's where I prefer, because the studies there are relatively small, 
and they're preliminary. And psilocybin's the next one in the shoot after MDMA to have some better trials published in that regard. <laughs> Instead of going into the details of like the study sizes and some of that sort of stuff, what I get asked about a lot is, how do psychedelics actually work, Doc? Like, what's going on inside of somebody's head? And what about that whole, like, crazy experience, right? Because with MDMA, there's fun stories about uh, psychologists back in the 70s doing group therapy together and all of them being in a room on MDMA together and saying, hey, let's see if we can think of the worst thing that we could possibly think of right now. And somebody says, let's think of our mothers being dead. And everybody just sits and thinks. And finally, somebody says, it's not that bad. <laughs> like the worst thing they could imagine. And if you're on MDMA, it's not that bad, right? You, with the classical psychedelics, you're starting to look at like the stories of bad trips. What's a bad trip? What does that mean? Uh, you know, like people go to the other side of Saturn and they talk to aliens and they come back. And is that really therapeutic? Is that actually going to help somebody outside of the context of being real close to dying? The clinical trials with psilocybin are looking at treatment-resistant depression at, you know, relatively low doses. But, I mean, here's the deal with psychedelics in general. What you're seeing right now when you look at me isn't reality. It's something that's more accurately classified as a consensus reality state. Have you heard of this before? So what we got taught maybe when we were kids was that your sense organs passively receive light and sound and vibration and pressure and temperature, and they just bring that into your brain and everybody else sees the world the way that you see the world because we're all just passive sensors. And that's not the way that your brain makes everything that you're looking at and hearing, including me right now. The cortex up top has a model that ultimately it inherited from your parents and that it's been making since you were a neurodevelopmental tube inside of your mom. And then you have sensation coming up from below through the brainstem. And the way that reality gets made is in the midbrain between the cortex and the brainstem, there's just error correction between the model and the sensation. And there are things that you miss all of the time that you are receiving as sensations because they don't match the model that's coming down. There's famous examples of this, about like the area that you can't see in your field of vision. Or if you focus on one particular thing, you're not able to see the things in the, the broad range. Uh, they, you know, there's examples of like, I'm gonna throw the basketball to you 10 times and you're gonna count and tell me when it's the 10th time. And then somebody in a gorilla suit on a unicycle rides by for 30 seconds behind the person throwing the basketball and they're counting and they're real focused on catching the basketball. 10, and then they say, all right, how long was the gorilla on the unicycle behind me? What gorilla on the unicycle? And then they play the tape back. Sure enough, there was a gorilla on a unicycle that you did not see because it did not match the model that you had learned to start creating your reality around, okay? Classical psychedelics in particular open up this consensus reality state between the model that your brain has been making since you first started having a brain and the sensations that are coming up from your brainstem. If you think of this as a shower of water coming down as a model and then fire coming up as sensation from below, your consensus reality state is just the mix of steam and smoke in between the model and the sensations. There's different switches that can be activated in this regard. A good book on it is called Con uh, Reality Switch Technologies by Dr. Andrew Gallimore. If I said anything correctly here, it's attributable to him. If I said anything wrong, that's on me, okay? Uh, but he identifies several switches in the brain. There's ketamine working at the NMDA receptor, and there's classical psychedelics working at the 5-HT2A receptor. So what psilocybin is doing in the brain is opening up the potential for you to perceive reality in a different way. That way winds up being a little bit like a hallucination while you're taking that medicine, but then after the medicine's not in someone's body anymore, there's the potential for them to see the world in a new light and from new perspectives that might not have been opened up to them 
without an exposure to a classical psychedelic like uh, a 5-HD2A agonist of any kind. So opening somebody up in that regard also involves neuroplasticity downstream from uh, taking the medicine, right? And this is a kind of a buzzword in research and in medicine and in society at this point is this idea of neuroplasticity. You've come across this one yet? Like, you make your brain plastic. You upregulate brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and that's like miracle growth for neurons, and we want to get more neurons, and you have a certain amount of hippocampal density loss that takes place with chronic depression, and taking ketamine or taking psilocybin can increase hippocampal density because of upregulating brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and there's all this stuff about neuroplasticity that's a, a big focus of research around psilocybin at this point. And neuroplasticity is a good thing for periods of time. It's like uh, you want your brain to be capable of making new connections and wiring in new neurons, especially if you've got a brain that's been damaged by alcohol use for years or chronic depression for years or any of the other chronic diseases that are, are taking place. Um, it's a good thing, but it may not be something that you want all of the time, right? You don't want to have a plastic brain all the time. You want it to become plastic, it to make some connections and you to use it. You don't want to eat all the time. You want to eat and then you want to go do some work with the energy that you made there. Same sort of idea with classical psychedelics. Neuroplasticity is useful for periods of time. I say this because microdosing is a big thing in the news at this point. And there are people looking at microdosing trials and whether microdosing is a good idea or a bad idea kind of depends on whether you think having a plastic brain all of the time is a good idea or a bad idea. Is it a good idea to walk around with your mouth hanging open all the time in the hopes that food might fall into it? I don't think so, but we'll wait and see how the clinical trials turn out around some of that sort of stuff before we make any decisions. Is that making sense so far? So finally, I'll talk about ibogaine just a little bit. And ibogaine is another interesting medicine, right? Um, it is derived from trees and roots in West Africa only, and in the 50s, it was a, an investigational drug that the brand name was Endabuse because we're always real clever about how we name pharmaceuticals in, in America, right? They named it Endabuse, and that's because it exerts this rapidly acting uh, reversal of opioid withdrawal and uh, addictions to several other sorts of substances that because it was you know, rescheduled as a Schedule I med and was one of the least studied of the psychedelics in the period before the war on drugs, we really don't know how exactly it does that. But what is normally uh, a 90-day window, if anybody works in uh, you know, addiction medicine or particularly around the opioid epidemic, there's this period of time where people begin treatment with methadone, buprenorphine, uh, naloxone, any of the appropriate medicines there, treatment as usual, and you're looking at uh, relapse and overdose period as a result of the somatic experience of all of the withdrawal symptoms where people generally either die by suicide or, uh, or overdose and, and relapse. There's this 90-day period that's considered like a danger area, and it's never easy. People you know, withdraw from opioids for years and years and are never the same again. And it seems anecdata level, small case studies and case series levels, that it can take that 90 days and crush it out in about 24 to 36 hours. Uh, you know, the way that that does that in the brain, again, we don't fully understand yet. There are some risks associated, known risks associated with it. It does prolong QT intervals. There's a cardiotoxicity uh, risk there that's known. There's some neurotoxicity risks at uh, higher doses, which is some of why the, the medicine was rescheduled there. There's a, a pending paper to be published in the next month or two by Dr. Nolan Williams where uh, putatively they may have been able to figure out a way to stabilize the cardiac membrane with high doses of magnesium similar to the way that we treat uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia and prevent some of the cardiotoxicity in that situation. I don't know any of the details there yet because it hasn't been published, but they're trying to look at ways to try to be able to do clinical research on ibogaine in a way that is safe 
beyond just the usual clinical trial enrollment, monitoring and pre-screening and having somebody on telemetry the whole time, all of those things would be a piece of this. There may also be some ways to prevent people from dying of taking ibogaine. In, in the wild, in you know, unmonitored non-clinical trials, there's at least 30 known cases of people taking ibogaine alongside of whatever other medicines they were taking and then having fatal cardiac arrhythmias. So it is a, a real risk to be considered. I bring this up today because the Kentucky Opioid Abatement Advisory Commission has allocated $42 million towards doing ibogaine research right here in Kentucky. Um, there was $842 million received from phar pharmaceutical companies in a settlement where Kentucky had sued. I imagine that most of us here in this room know someone that's been affected directly by the opioid ep epidemic, given the way that the coal miners in eastern Kentucky were virtually targeted for uh, pill mills and Oxycontin in the you know 90s and early 2000s, you know the dope sick uh, TV show or some of the documentaries out there. I'll give a whole bunch of background info on all of that. Kentucky has about 842 million dollars to try to implement into treatment of opioid use disorder here. Now most of that money has been allocated to new infrastructure, new homes, new beds, new hospital programs. And this is about four or five percent of that money that they're looking at allocating to trying to do ibogaine clinical trials so that we can get some of the answers as clinicians around some of this sort of stuff. There's a, there was an interesting study published in the Journal of Military Psychology earlier this year with 87 Special Forces veterans that were sent to a clinic in Mexico where they took ibogaine and where they took another uh, unique medicine called 5-MEDO-DMT and they monitored them for uh, alcohol use disorder and again this is like a case study this isn't a clinical trial but the cases that were reported the level to which their drinking and their cravings were curbed was the sort of stuff that sounds more like science fiction than science fact if uh, it's an interesting study um, if you know and if you're curious about all of those sorts of things I had one of the study participants on my podcast and interviewed him about, uh, and talked about an hour of what it was like for him to take Ibogaine. So you can uh, ask me about that later and I'd be happy to give you links or whatever in that regard if, if this is something that you're curious about. So the question will be, you know, will, that, will the funding come through and will we be able to run some of those clinical trials here in Kentucky? Time will tell and uh, we'll wait and see, but I'll be, making a whole bunch of noise about it one way or the other just because I'd like to see the outcomes of the clinical trials, right? I'd like to know the answers. I'm always in favor of more research. I think most clinicians are. I think that's probably enough for me at this point. Do you have any questions about the meaning of life or where do babies come from or any of that sort of stuff? I'd be happy to, to make something up. She's asking me about my opinion on companies that do ketamine through the mail for at-home delivery and what's, what's my opinion of that. I have not done any of that sort of work because it seems to me that the relative risk there versus reward uh, isn't something that I'd want to get involved in. There are access issues, right? There are people who couldn't get to a ketamine clinic where they're gonna get appropriate levels of treatment and therapy. They're probably not coming to your clinic if they have access issues because they're so remote, right? So there, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna pan that and say that it's a bad idea. There's some people who will get access to helpful medicines from that, that way of conducting things, but outside of those sorts of use cases, it seems like high risk, low reward to me, my personal professional opinion. There's a lot more going on there. Um, is that helpful to you to have those conversations with those patients or are you looking for something more direct about that company? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Um, I mean, oral ketamine 
the amount that becomes bioavailable, like your liver chews through ketamine pretty quickly. Um, I think it's CYP2B6 is the primary mover in that regard, and then 3A4 is involved. And you wind up getting like whatever dose they're taking, it winds up being like 19 to 25% of that is what makes it into the brain later on. And that's not great, right? But they can titrate up the dose further. Uh, and I don't know the model, but you're supposed to be doing kind of telehealth where somebody's monitoring you there, right? Like we, we write for benzos all the time. And in, in my opinion, benzos are a more you know, dangerous medicine than oral ketamine would be in terms of the risk of somebody driving with it or doing something foolish with it, right? So the relative risk compared to some of the alternatives, pretty low. But the chance of efficacy of them feeling immensely better from doing that, lower, much, so then going to a reputable uh, ketamine provider of one kind or another where they're gonna get it either intravenously or intramuscularly where you're getting 95 to 100% of bioavailability and you're getting a lot closer monitoring while they're taking the medicine because it's in person and you can make sure somebody's back to their baseline before they're leaving and all of those sorts of things seem to me to be much lower risk as a clinician and much higher reward for the patient comparatively. Again, if you live in the middle of nowhere and the only way to do this is mail order, then you're solving an access problem, but I don't know if that's their business model, right? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Advertising. Yeah, I'm gonna try to repeat that question. Asking about MDMA and the clinical trials where they're running through the three medicine sessions and what if somebody has a crisis in between sessions is essentially what you're getting at, right? And they had that happen and you're kind of, like I said, covered in a blanket of therapy during that period of time. It's very intensive, time intensive for everybody. You know, you're doing three 60 to 90 minute sessions with two therapists and in a clinical trial setting, right? Um, the therapies that are being used there are all evidence-based, evidence-focused therapies, so they can bring in the appropriate therapies at that point. I don't know if any of you are familiar with CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. If you're not, you should get familiar with it because they're about to publish some data around that that's gonna show that CAMS is superior to CBT and DBT, which are both the sort of standard of care at this point for acute suicidality. Um, but CAMS is a, a very intelligent way of approaching an acutely suicidal person and helping them navigate that headspace in a way that shows greater success. The CAMS design, the CAMS model takes about 90 days, but Massachusetts General Hospital is running a clinical trial now where they're combining ketamine treatments with an accelerated version of CAMS and they're starting to see acutely suicidal people who are no longer suicidal or just kind of simmering suicidal in you know, a few weeks time, which is some of what my practice has focused on for about the last three years is a ton of those sorts of folks where we're, we're trying to do suicide interventions alongside of ketamine and CAMS is just gonna be the gold standard in the next couple of years around some of that. Now they didn't, that doesn't really answer your question about what they did in the clinical trials or what we would do with MDMA, and a lot of that's just gonna depend on the rules and regulations that come down from the FDA, from the DEA, and then the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation that'll be the first pharmaceutical company that'll provide MDMA, and we'll just follow all of the rules in that regard. My leaning forward sort of thinking would be if somebody became acutely suicidal or were you know, rapidly destabilized, there'd be ways to integrate 
ketamine and CAMS into the, ca the ongoing care of a person who's in crisis with their ongoing MDMA therapy. Is that helpful and answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Is this an inpatient program? For the MDMA, th like I said, they'll roll out the rules and then we'll figure it out, but I don't think it's going to be from the way that the clinical trials were run. It sounded like it'll be, you know, available, an inpatient version and a community-based version and private practice versions the same way most other interventions are. Yeah. yeah. That's all I got for you. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>